All right, you two, I'll work alone. Pilate has determined that Jesus is not guilty. He is now trying to convince the crowd of what he already knows. His first attempt was to bargain. We heard him in that reading last week. He's trying to exchange Barabbas for Jesus. Barabbas, by the way, from all accounts, is guilty of everything that they have charged Jesus with, but this doesn't work. It's not about the charge. It's about who Jesus is. So that's not going to work. So Pilate then appeals to sympathy. He has Jesus whipped. He dresses him up in a mock robe. He puts a crown of thorns upon his head. He is beaten, humiliated, stripped of his clothes. He's stripped of his dignity. Pilate parades him out there in front of everybody and says, Behold the man. Pilate's hoping that this will drum up for these Jews some compassion, some sympathy. I get it that you don't like him, Pilate thinks. But look at him. How could he be a threat to anybody? It doesn't work. They scream, crucif crucify him, crucify him all the more. Pilate's thinking, well, at, at the very least, he's still, he's a nice Jewish boy. He's been beaten up by a bunch of Romans. To put it in cultural context, I hate Alabama football just as much as everybody else, but I still don't want to see them beaten by Ohio. <laughs> Nobody deserves that. And even the sympathy doesn't work either. Pilate then tries to hand Jesus off. You crucify him yourself if you think he's guilty. At this point, the Jewish officials go back to the original charge. They say, this man claims to be God. It seems that this frightens Pilate even more than the previous charges. He brings Jesus back inside. He is determined to learn more about this man. But Jesus responds to none of Pilate's questions except the small little charge about his authority. Pilate desperately wants to release Jesus. He has found no guilt within him, but he has done everything he can think of, every trick that he has ever learned in rising through the ranks of bureaucratic Rome, and he cannot get Jesus off his hands. Finally, the Jews cry out, If you release him, you are no friend of Caesar's. And that'll do it. Anybody who makes himself a king opposes Caesar, and that's about it, game over. There is nothing that Pilate covets more than his friendship with Tiberius Caesar. His whole life is built upon this relationship. His position, his power, his wealth, his, 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 uh, his lifestyle, it's all built upon this relationship with the emperor they call Tiberius. And so Jesus is handed over to be crucified. To contrast Pilate's idolatry with Jesus' faithfulness is profound. Brian Wolfmuller says that we can look at this kind of like a parable. This is not what John's intention is, by the way. He's not telling us that this is a parable, but we can sort of look at it that way. Imagine that you're just in that town at the time. You're wandering through Jerusalem on that day. You hear the crowd. You wander through to find this little courtyard, bathed in morning light, filled with all these excitable people. And on the platform, you see two very different men. One is a Roman. He's got that nice, strong body of a retired soldier, probably verging on a dad bod a little bit. I know you like him. I, it's okay. He's a good man, good looking guy. As a retired Roman soldier, he's probably got a couple of scars, maybe even a couple of tattoos. You know how those soldiers like their tattoos? He's got fine clothes. He's got gold rings. He sits on a throne. He's the friend of Caesar. He has a palace. He has an army. He has a beautiful wife. Probably got a couple of, couple of horses back there someplace that you can't see, but I'm sure they're there. All the people are looking at him. Everybody wants to know what he has to say. Everybody wants to know what he has to think. He is one of the most popular people in all of Jerusalem. He is, by every single worldly standard and measure, he is the absolute picture of success. 
He's a major dude, as we say in the 90s. And then there's another man. This man's Jewish, right? He's an outsider to a certain extent. Even in Jerusalem, he's still a little bit of an outsider. He's bleeding. He's weak. Barely the strength to stand. His face is bruised. He's got blood coagulating all over him. They've plucked out pieces of his beard. He kind of looks like he's got a little bit of mange, right? Pieces of him are falling out here and there. Maybe got a broken tooth. Wrapped in a filthy robe, crown of thorns upon his head, abandoned by all of his followers, hated by the crowd. He has nothing. He has nothing. He has no home, no money, no friends, no options. And as you're considering the scene with these two men, somebody comes up behind you and goes, Hey, Bubby, which one do you follow? Of course, we all know full well who we're supposed to follow. We're all good Christian folk here listening to good Christian sermons. We all know the right answer is Jesus. We'll follow Jesus. But let's pretend that you don't know Jesus. Let's pretend you don't know what this story is about. That you're just a stranger in Jerusalem and judging by outward appearances, it looks like Pilate has got everything put together, doesn't he? He's the picture of success. Good education, good job, good family, more than that. He has wealth power, political success. If Pilate wrote a self-help book on how to rise through the ranks of the Roman military, you'd probably read it. Jesus looks like the exact opposite. He, he doesn't have anything. Condemned as a criminal. He's been beaten by the crowd, beaten and mocked, not even wearing his own clothes. He's weak, rejected, shamed, mocked. If we were strangers in Jerusalem, I don't think this decision would be very difficult for any of us to make. Put me on Team Pilot. I want to be with the guy that's winning. I don't know that other guy. And yet God continues, even in this day, to work through those things that are hidden from the eye of common man. Jesus' majesty here in that place is hidden in humility. His glory is hidden in blood. His kingdom comes in the midst of suffering, and his rule is that which of a cross. Jesus is the king of glory, but that glory cannot be seen by the eyes of regular old human men. They miss it. It can only be seen through the words of faith. It can only be seen through the Spirit of God. This is what Jesus tells Peter so long ago in Matthew chapter 16, 17, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. You all know Jesus to be the right answer. Thanks be unto God that you know that Jesus is that right answer. And you have been led to that answer. You have been given that answer. You have been given the, this, this great gift of knowledge of who the Savior is. Give glory unto God for that, for that knowledge. Pilate makes himself a friend to Caesar, and that's the only reward he's going to get. History shows he only holds on to this position another couple of years before he's deposed. Jesus warns us, Well, will a prophet a man if he gained the entire world and yet forfeit his soul? Pilate has everything. Almost. He has everything except Jesus. Jesus, who is the Savior of the world, who is standing right there in front of him. He is, he is so close. I mean, the God of heaven and earth is sitting right there in front of him, and Pilate misses it. Pilate's king is Caesar. His kingdom is of this world. His God is his own success. He was successful in a lot of things. I think the world would have said Pilate is successful at almost everything he has put his hand to. But he failed, and he failed at that one thing that was truly needful. Now, the point of this little thought experiment is not to make you despise nice clothes. You don't have to be poorly educated to love Jesus, despite what the atheists would like you to think. You can even be politically connected, if you so see the, the need. But salvation is not always obvious. 
The kingdom of God does not always come by observation. If we remember the words of Isaiah from chapter 53, he says, he had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, no beauty that we should desire him. We're called to follow the crowned king, the king who has been crowned with thorns and exalted upon a cross, called into a kingdom that is not of this world, to belong to a suffering servant whose death is our life, whose shed blood is our hope, whose broken body is our peace. If we look at Jesus with the eyes of the world, we're going to see a poor man who's just been abandoned and condemned. But when we look at the eyes of faith, we see God in the flesh bearing our sins, carrying our sorrows, winning for us an eternal kingdom of joy and peace and then giving us that kingdom free of charge. Yes, only with the eyes of faith can we see the glorious king of salvation hidden under the humility of Jesus' suffering, his humiliation, his suffering, his agony, and all of this was for you, so that you would be his, our savior, our friend, our king, who brings us righteousness and hope and peace. In Jesus' name, amen.